Mr Richard Bennion. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I do applaud the uh, two honourable members for uh, securing uh, this debate. And it's a great pleasure to be able to debate an issue uh, that is one of many issues that is more important than Brexit. And some of my constituents disagree with me on this. But this is an existential issue. Brexit, in a year or two, if I'm optimistic, or more if I'm pessimistic, will be something that we will have moved on from, I promise. But this, this is an issue, I can dream, this is an issue that will, is absolutely imperative that we tackle. Uh, the Pentagon, surprisingly to some, is an organisation that has looked very carefully at the impact of climate change and our ability to tackle it. They refer to climate change as a risk escalator, increasing the pressure on migration, increasing uh, the huge cost of stabilising failed states and the impact it can have on the security of the world. And no one should underestimate the impact climate change will have and is having on all our lives. Uh, I find it fascinating to look at the crucial nexus between environmental degradation and security. And we face a huge challenge, not just in terms of the recommendations of the IPCC and all that comes from that, but to look at the wider context and the wider implications of not tackling climate change. I thank the honourable gentleman for giving way, and he and I probably both have received the, the NFU briefing, uh, which refers to, to uh, and, and that the Oxford Farming Conference and, and January of intervention. And I do, um, and I speak as somebody who knows a bit about this subject and has been trying to embrace these techniques in what I've been doing through the uh, less than perfect mechanism of the common agricultural policy. And I am excited about the potential for agriculture playing its part, and I think the NFU is right to be leading that. Uh, very... uh, just before he moves off uh, the security relationship, uh, does he agree with me that um, almost certainly, other than North Korea and the Calcutta? Uh, my right hand friend is, of course, right. And if anybody has looked out of an aeroplane window at that delta and thought what the implications would be of, a, of even a, just a one metre rise, uh, the impact that would have, the devastating, catastrophic, tragic impact that would have on those that live there would be magnitude, would be multiplied by an enormous magnitude in terms of the knock-on effect in the surrounding area, and it is absolutely vivid. I, I'll give away one more time and then I'll make some progress. Member, for giving way, and also on a related issue, um, we talk a lot about the melting of the polar ice caps, but if you look at what is happening in the Himalayas, in what is sometimes known as the third pole, with the thawing of the permafrost and the melting of the ice there, regions. Uh, 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 we, could, we could go on a global tour of vital Im environmental uh, play, uh, assets for this planet that are at serious risk of irretrievably being damaged unless we tackle this, and she's absolutely right to raise that. I just want to make a very quick point, just a very quick point about sometimes... I'll give away quickly. I'm grateful for being very generous, but on, on a related point, it's not just the melting of the ice caps as well, but in the Tibetan plateau, the water sources come from there for 40% of the world. Uh, my honourable friend is, is absolutely right to raise this, and that's what, what's so, in a way, invigorating by these debates desperate though the issue is, is that there is an enormous amount of expertise uh, across this House of people who really understand and see and have seen for themselves the impact uh, of what we are at risk of facing. Uh, I just want to cut off, perhaps for the final time I hope in my life, the question of, that is put by some people who deny the human impact of climate change. And if anybody is sometimes like me assailed by people who uh, who read certain journalists and uh, acquire a view, uh, I would just recommend a book by Richard Black, the former BBC environment co correspondent, called Denied. It is, an, it is a forensic, demolishing, a devastating takedown of climate change denial. And it, it goes through all the arguments in absolute detail. It has an outstanding forward by uh, a member of this House, but it is also 
Uh, but it's also in its content. Yeah, it is me. I'm sorry. About that. Uh, but but it, in its content of the book is absolutely superb, and I do recommend it, uh, despite despite the forward. Uh, he refers to climate change deniers as. Um, as contrarians rather than sceptics, and I think that's the right thing to do. It's good to be a sceptic. It's good to be sceptical about received wisdoms. But contrarians tend to be the, the golf club bore who, uh, who strikes an opinion with no basis of information. And this is scientific evidence uh, that really na nails that subject. I just want to come on to the question of the school strike. So, rightly raised by the Honourable Member for uh, Abingdon uh, North, uh, and Oxford. Um, I think it's right to welcome this event, and I think that some people uh, got, the, got it wrong. They missed the point about this. We can all complain about children bunking off school, but that is not the point here. This it showed some extraordinary passion by young people whose lives will be much more affected by uh, people in their middle age like me. And that passion needs to be harnessed. Uh, I was moved uh, a couple of days ago downstairs in the Churchill Room to see uh, the excellent Year of Green Action event organised by uh, ministers at DEFRA and to hear the evidence of two young people from Gedling, I think, uh, Amy and Ella Meek, who have set up a a, a, a venture that has gone viral called Kids Against Plastic uh, and it's that kind of action that we want to encourage amongst those young people who came to our office or who, who we saw uh, on that day because this is not just something that policy makers and politicians will deliver, it's something that people on the ground of all ages, uh, can, if you'll allow me I'll just make a bit of progress, the people of all ages can make a difference. Uh, 30 or so young people from Newbury turned up at my office and I was struck, as I say, by their passion and their commitment. But it, I was also left with a strong belief that we need to inform people better about what is going on. I've already heard some things in this debate that are uh, saying why isn't something happening when it is, uh, you know, why aren't we doing more on that when that is happening. And we need to applaud in a cross-party consensual way when good things are done and push relentlessly when we think uh, we are missing the point. Very quickly. Kim, for giving way, will you join me in welcoming, welcoming my Little Litter Heroes campaign where we um, got primary school children involved in, in making sculptures out of their recycled goods and encourage them to recycle everything where possible? Yeah. Well, I'm going to get my children onto that. I'm a serial litter picker to their dismay. And I think that is a fantastic uh, th in initiative. Uh, if she'll allow me, I'll just make a bit more progress. When I was discussing with these uh, young people, I, I was conscious that none of them knew that the UK uh, was the first developed economy to uh, pass the Climate Change Act. Um, why should they be in a way? It's a rather processy thing to know. But nevertheless, it does show that across this House there's been a determination to act. That this country has reduced its emissions by over 40%, more than any other uh, developed G7 economy. I asked them how many of them knew about Blue Belt and all their hands stayed down. And Blue Belt is one of the policies in recent years that I am most proud of. And my right honourable friend, the, the member for West Dorset, is yeah, yeah. fundamental at driving that through. Well, I have to say a bit of institutional opposition in certain departments, but he did it. And it is, we are now protecting an area of sea the size of India, shortly to grow to much larger areas. And we are policing that with modern uh, satellite technology. And it is an extraordinary thing that we in Britain should be proud of, particularly those of us who are swept away by Blue Planet 2, to say, say at least we've got a government that's doing something about this. There has been a huge leap in renewable energy. Uh, uh, record amounts of power is now generated renewably. Uh, uh, the 25-year environment plan has things in it that those young people would be really pleased to see, and of course they are, would be right to push us to make sure that it happens. And that work done on this House, and I have to say particularly on these benches in recent uh, months with letters to the Prime Minister and Ministers meeting with the, my right honourable friend who would be responding to this debate, uh, and a move which is clearly now, I think, uh, inevitable, which is a move to net zero. So why, why do we need this to happen? We need it to happen because the science is clear. The science is staring at us in the face. Yeah. In October of last year, the IPC said 
uh, IPCC said that the, there was an even chance of meeting a 1.5 uh, degree target for uh, global CO2 emissions. But the ab absolute imperative of reaching net zero, and it said forth this really extraordinary challenge to policy makers all over the world, that there are a dozen years, 12 years left uh, to deliver, deliver this. So I'm really pleased that my right honourable friend, the Minister for Climate Change, has instructed the Climate Change Committee for, for a feasibility, for an impact study on what it would actually mean, what we would be requiring our economy to do. And it's no good for us in this House just stating words like net zero without really understanding there will be an impact. It will affect businesses. But if we do it in the right way, businesses, firstly, can transition. And secondly, there is a, an economic opportunity here for Grit Britain to continue to be a centre for green growth, and that this fits in with the green growth uh, strategy. In the wider context, uh, this is a key moment for the United Kingdom. Domestically, we have new legislation coming before this House on fisheries, on farming, on the environment, uh, and on other related subjects. As a farmer, as a conservationist, as someone who, who has been and is active in the NGO movement, I'm a trustee of uh, of a charity called Plant Life, uh, and I am therefore excited at the opportunities offered to take control of our environmental agenda and to really make sure we do what we've been talking about for a long time but it seem unable to do, which is to reverse the declines in biodiversity and to significantly reduce emissions from agriculture, and if you like, to weaponise the natural environment, to lock up carbon and to be a sustainable su su source of the necessities of life, such as clean water. Yeah. Right. Would, would he agree with me, and I know of his great reputation as a farmer, it, ha, have we not got to do something about the dairy industry and the effect on waterways, rivers and streams? I, I actually think the best way to protect our environment is to have more grass as part of rotation. So I think that if you make sweeping statements that close down certain industries, those farmers then go... I know, I know that's not the point the, 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 the Honourable Gentleman is making, but there are, uh, there are swings and roundabouts on this, and I, I, mean, I, was a, I was probably the only dairy farmer in the House of Commons until I stopped being a dairy farmer. But, uh, so I know a little <laughs> bit about this, and uh, I'm happy to talk to him about it. But internationally, and I am coming to the conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, our leadership on tackling climate change the protection of our oceans, reducing pollution, can be a key component of what people mean when they refer to global Britain. As a minister, uh, and as a devout pro-European, as a minister, I sat at international fora, such as the International Whaling Commission, UN uh, uh, Congress of the Parties, and I sat for too long in EU coordination meetings, lowering the ambitions the United Kingdom had in order to have one single agreed view across the European Union. Now we can have that ambition, we can raise our game, we can reconnect with organisations that we have frankly withdrawn from, and I'm looking for silver linings to our current cloud, and this is very much one of them. I will conclude by returning to the school strike. We make a mistake if we just refer to this in terms of uh, what they would view as old people complaining about them having too much uh, nerve to bunk off school, or just tell them the good things. We need to agree with them that there is a problem and that much more needs to be done, and we need to explain it. Thank goodness in this country this is a cross-party issue, unlike the United States where it is a polarising, divisive issue. We can do this together and we can be a world leader. Yeah.